In this town, there's no off-season. The news never stops, and neither do we. It's always game day in Cleveland with Andy Baskin and Daryl Ryder. It is always game day in Cleveland. He's Daryl Ryder. I'm Andy Baskin. We are brought to you by our good friends at Smiley One and Bryant, Northeast Ohio's premier heating and cooling solution. Daryl, I think I look like, uh, maybe I should back my light up a little bit. Yeah, that's not too bad. All right, so Daryl, let's uh, let's start this podcast off with just the mood of Berea because I got to be honest, it's uh, it's tough taking phone calls all day long. People are not happy. Um, you know, you trade Amari Cooper. You trade a guy that I think most people consider to be the best wide receiver on the team for the last couple of years, and now all of a sudden you're saying, well, did they throw up the white flag? So, just give me the mood of Berea. Uh, I think it's kind of uh, what it's been the last couple of weeks. Um, Nick Chubb being back uh, brought some hooting and hollering from his teammates uh, as he uh, stood at the podium waiting for us to get in the locker room and, and gather around. Um, it is a reception that others on the team do not receive from their teammates, ah. in the room, if you know what I'm saying. Sure. Well, especially after the story today in the uh, Players' Journal. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, they seem to be taking uh, the Amari Cooper trade is just, you know, par for the course as far as business in the NFL. Guys get moved all the time. As Kevin Stefanski said today, you know, injuries happen. Guys become unavailable for one reason or another. So um, I, I don't, not that it would matter, but I, I didn't get the sense that there was like some big downer hangover from that trade. I mean, look, they're one. So they five. don't feel like like it doesn't feel like that's a let's throw up the white flag deal, right? Well, I mean, they're one in five. I think they understand. And they know what the flag yeah. looks like. Yeah. Yeah, like they they kind of know what the situation is. They don't need to be told or reminded. And and I think that that I, I kind of feel like that that's the the meaning behind the well, it's just you know part of business in the NFL. Guys getting traded. I you know what I'm saying. I think that's their way yeah. of saying it without coming out and and saying it. And and look, kudos right. to Andrew Perry. I mean, he did. He made a great trade. He got a third round pick for him when he to acquire him from the Cowboys. Barry gave up a fifth round pick. So two years older, Andrew Barry went up two rounds with a draft pick and had Amari Cooper here to catch for a thousand yards in each of uh, those two full seasons with the Browns. So. Uh, great job there by Andrew Berry executing that trade. And you know what? I also want to say this, Andy. I know you want to move on, but um, no, I have I, a couple of questions about this before we move on. To, but go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, like I'm happy for Amari. Like I, I am too. I, I think this is a fresh start for him. You know? Yeah, I, I think he's going to light it up in Buffalo. I was texting a couple of our buddies, uh, our sister station there up there in Buffalo. I told him you're going to like him. He doesn't talk much. Keeps to himself, but he's very professional. He's a really good player, um, and he's well respected within his locker rooms. And uh, I, I honestly think that he's going to go off because he he's actually going to be playing with a good quarterback again. I, I agree. So here's my question for you, because I I mean, we talked about this a little bit off Mike yesterday. I, was he unhappy here? Because I, I like I hear hosts just drilling him saying he didn't want to be here. He hated being here. Funny, last year, I didn't think he hated being here, especially when he's having big games. I could understand that he may have had that Baker Mayfield feeling right when they tried to when you start hearing your name in trade rumors and you think it's legit, I, I can, I, I kind of respect that. And the fact that he probably felt like this was his last year with the Browns, no matter what happened. So, I mean, I, I do think there's something called athletic depression that you, that happens and we can all say it's a business, but at the end of the day, these guys are human. And, you know, I, he had a fantastic year last year and, he was working with Joe Flacco, and those two seemed to work very, very well together. Yeah, I don't think he was unhappy here. I think he was frustrated here. And I, and for me, there's, there's a difference there. You can make a distinction between the two. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's frustrated. The football isn't where it's supposed to be when it's supposed to be. And so that leads to some other things, the drop passes and, and whatnot. You know, it seemed like once a game – Deshaun Watson had to walk up to him and and whatever they would say to because there was miscommunication or a missed route or whatever. Um, and and then as you mentioned, the the, the Brandon Ayuk rumors um that had popped up. And, and look, he probably also felt unappreciated because he was gonna hold he he threatened to hold out in training camp, didn't go to mini camp, 
got he was able to at least get his 20 million guaranteed this year but like they wouldn't give him a contract extension they they you know they wouldn't guarantee him money in future years so if you're Amari coming off back to back 1000 yard receiving seasons for a franchise that has never had a wide receiver do that in its history dating back to 1946 yeah i'm just putting myself in Amari's shoes i i'm going to be a little upset and i'm going to be a little hurt by that so i don't think he was unhappy i just feel like he was frustrated and the browns did what the browns do to good players at times and that is they broke him i mean they just absolutely broke amari he is one of the most professional players i've been around uh, in my years covering uh, the browns and the nfl and the browns broke that guy yeah it's just kind of i i i mean the whole thing is just it's kind of a sad story. So let me move forward. Who's going to get the opportunities now? Where do you think they're going to go with this? And, you know, uh, there's a number of guys on this roster, and I think the most interesting one, whether you want to believe it or not, is um, I, I, it's got to be Kadarius Tony. Like, that keeps going through my mind that I wonder if they're going to elevate him. What, what do you think they're going to do? Based on Kevin Stefanski's answer, I think David Njoku is going to get more targets. I think the running backs are going to get more targets. Maybe they mix in the rookie Jamari Thrash. Uh, maybe Cedric Tillman, assuming he knows what routes he's supposed to run, when he's supposed to run them. You know, James Prochet, do they, you know, take a look at him uh, a little bit? And then, of course, yeah, I mean, I think that Jerry Judy and Elijah Moore will pick up uh, some of those uh, targets as well, uh, you know, for at least as long as Elijah Moore is going to be here, because I do feel like that if, if this thing continues to go south, you know, Elijah Moore is among those guys that you could potentially trade before the deadline because he's in the final year of his deal. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if there's teams looking at him. I, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there's rumblings right now that Elijah Moore might be a guy who could be on the trade block too. I, I don't know. He hasn't done anything here really to, to garner wanting right. him, but maybe it's just uh, another scenario of a guy who just – I mean, I'm not trying to be mean, but what has no, he done I, to kind of stand up? It is what it is, man. Like, it, it just – it is what it is, right? I mean – Look, they I don't, don't. The whole thing just kind of sucks. I, I just, I, I just, I, I just, it's hard for me to erase the fact that Amari Cooper had so much success last year and just nothing seemed to work right this year. And, and, and I think he may have sealed his fate last week. You know, what happens if he catches that first down pass last week? I do think that I, you, you talk about giving Andrew Barry credit. I'll give him credit because I don't think he gets a third and a seventh for him for a six and, and a player to Buffalo if he waits until November 5th. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I, I just felt that it was they needed to trade him, get you know, get what you can when you can for him, and um, so the timing was perfect. Uh, I don't have any criticism about the trade. I it was absolutely the right football move to make. You're going nowhere. He's frustrated. Um, you know, everybody in the building is pretty much frustrated at this point. It, it, you know, one in five, the offense is the worst in the national football league by a mile. Um, and you know, there's just like, there, there's nothing to look at offensively where you could cling to hope. Right. You know, right. There's, it's there's just no, not there. There's nothing they do that you're like, well, they, they do that well. And, and I've said it for weeks. Um, even going back to training camp, they do nothing well on offense. So, um, I thought Barry did a good job getting Amari out of here. Get and you know what too, you know Barry put him in a pretty good situation. He he maximized the value, got good value for him in return, and also sent him to a team where he can go and be successful. Because I I think him and Josh Allen are going to light it up in Buffalo. I really I, I do too. I totally agree with you. I, I think you know I think Brown he's going to be successful. Pissed. You know they're going to do the Baker Mayfield thing right now, and they're going to do. Uh, you know, the Joe Flacco thing that they've been doing and whatnot. Look, extenuating circumstances by the uh, surrounding the departures of both of those players. And same thing with Amari. It just it wasn't happening with Amari here this year. And I wish him nothing but the best. I hope he goes up to Buffalo and kicks some serious ass. All right. So you've said that. I'll say this. Let's do this. Um, Amari's been traded. Is there anybody else on the block? We're going to bring that up next. On It's always game day in Cleveland. It's always game day in Cleveland. He, again, is Daryl Ryder. I'm Andy Baskin. Thanks for listening along the Odyssey lines. And, of course, we love when you watch on YouTube as well. We are brought to you by our good friends at Smiley One and Bryant, Northeast Ohio's premier heating and cooling solution. All right, Daryl, so Amari Cooper is gone. Let's go through some of the names that might be traded somewhere down the road here. 
And I know that the number one person on this team that garners the most value, whether he's injured or not, would be Miles Garrett. Uh, your reaction to maybe Miles Garrett being on the trading block? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, that was pretty quick. Yeah, that was a very Kevin Stefanski answer. Yeah, no. Um, I, I just I I feel like similar to like Nick Chubb, if they traded Miles Garrett, there like there would be a revolt <laughs> in Cleveland, right? I mean, right. he's a generational talent. He's a cornerstone. You're just you're not finding that guy. No matter how many first round picks you get for him, you're just not finding that guy again, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I feel the same way about Denzel Ward. Um, that you, you keep the cornerstones because I don't feel like they need to burn the whole house down. They need to do one thing, replace the quarterback. That's it. That's it. They need yeah, but is that going to happen? Like you're yeah. going to try to tell me there, there was somebody on the afternoon show that uh, was uh, that was a guest that suggested maybe they could trade Miles Garrett. I don't know, like a Brock Osweiler kind of deal. I didn't get the full gist of it. Yeah. Oh, you mean uh, um, you could trade Deshaun? Yeah, I just yeah, I Deshaun. What did I, what did I say? Did I say somebody else? You said Miles. Um, oh, I'm sorry, not Miles. Deshaun. Yeah. Remember, we're not trading Miles. Um, okay. Daryl says we're not trading miles. I would not put it past them to trade Denzel. Yeah, I, I could see him. I could see that. I don't agree with it, but I could see it. But again, I don't feel like this needs to be a complete roster teardown. And if you trade miles, that's exactly what you're doing. Okay. You do not need to do this. You just need to have the testicular fortitude to admit you screwed up with Deshaun Watson. It's not going to happen though. Daryl. It's not happen. Run a 52-man roster for uh, a year or two until you can make the cap thing manageable. <laughs> you have to pay him no matter what. And, you know, you, you just move on. Like, I, I just – this does not have to be a teardown. It really doesn't. And and the folks that keep talking about, okay, yes, the offensive line needs repaired. Absolutely. Guess what? They have a first-round pick again this year, Andy, that they can use on an offensive lineman, right? Right. Um, some people will say trade that first round pick. See if you can trade that first round pick with Deshaun Watson because everybody knows it's going to be a really high pick. Yeah, but you're, I, I just, nobody's going to take on Deshaun and the cap figures and all that kind of stuff. Like they're just not going to do it. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't see any scenario where Deshaun can be traded or will be traded. Like, let, let me, let me ask this. I'm going to, I'll get into more players that can be traded. Is there a way that if they wanted to play these games with Deshaun on the team, on not the in, not on the field, is yeah. that a possibility? I I think it has to be, because I mean, I. So he becomes I, the highest paid backup in the history of the league. Yeah, well, it, there's frustration in the locker room. Okay, like let's call it the way it is. Okay, there you know there's a little frustration in the locker room, not public frustration. But you can feel it, you know what I mean. Like you're in the, you can you can feel the frustration that they they don't feel that they should be one in five, and they don't feel that they should be in this position where a season is basically wasted. But here we are, right? And a big reason why that is is combination the line, but also combination the quarterback don't know what the hell he's doing, and you're paying that guy forty six million dollars a year. And so here, and, and I'll use this analogy. I was thinking about this, um, Andy, because you're not the first to bring up the the the, the trading Miles Garrett thing. But like, yeah, it's not. I trust me. I don't want them to trade Miles Garrett. Miles, Let me be on the record for that. But but Miles is making twenty five million dollars a year. He's a reigning defensive player of the year. Brings it each and every week. Plays through injury. You know, doesn't make excuses. Uh, you know, he should be making thirty plus million dollars a year. But he's looking at the guy that's making you know, 46 who is struggling to complete screen passes or, uh, you know, anything beyond 10 yards in the air. Right. And so if you're that guy and you're in the prime of your career, which miles Garrett is like, how are you going to feel? Right. Um, a guy like Joel Batonio, he said that last week, um, in his media availability, he said, look, I've accomplished all there's to accomplish in my career. I'm a six time pro bowler. I think three, four time, uh, all pro AP, uh, player. I just want to win like that. The, the quote was, I just want to win End quote. That was the quote from Joel Batonio last week. Okay. He wants to win football games. He didn't give a crap about anything else. He just wants to win now because Joel is such a professional. So Joel, how do you think Deshaun's playing? Well, I believe in, you know, his response is always, I believe in Deshaun. We're here to support Deshaun. My job is to block for Deshaun, right? Because he's a professional, but as a human being, I feel for the guy. 
This is supposed to be his glory days going on the way out the door into retirement, right? right. You know, um, and, and granted, he did have two playoff seasons with the Browns, which is two more playoff seasons than Joe Thomas had with the Browns. But still, like, um, so these guys are human. And, of course, you know, you got receivers that are frustrated because the passing game isn't, you know, going as well as it should. But, again, they're being professionals. They're not um, – you know, they're not projecting any frustration. They're saying all the right things publicly. Deshaun Watson on Wednesday said all the right things publicly. But, like, I mean, if there wasn't frustration in that building right now, Andy, then, like, people should, like, quit. Because they should totally agree. Yeah, I agree with that. You, know, agree. you know what I'm saying? Like, when you're here, I'm going to read the rankings here real quick, like, because I, okay. I pulled them up. I've got to make my work pay off here. Browns ranked 32nd, which, by the way, is dead last. 32 out of 32 teams in. Total, Total offense, offense. Yeah. yards per play, pass yards per play, sacks, first downs, third down efficiency. They're ranked 30th in scoring and passing. They're 28th in rushing and 20th in rushing yards per attempt. That, my friends, is embarrassingly awful considering the volume of talent that is on this roster and the expectations going into this year and the money that has been spent on this football team. There's there's no reason for this offense to be this terrible other than, well, the quarterback is terrible. Hmm. All right, any other names on the list of possible trade? Uh, yeah, I mean, so these are guys who have, uh, you know, expiring contracts and can be free agents next year, right? Okay. Uh, I, the only reason I include Nick Chubb is because he is in the final year of his deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I want to stress to people, I'm not advocating for any of these guys to be traded. I'm just giving you the facts of who's in the final year of their contract that potentially could be a candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, Rodney McLeod, who had now that uh, Amari Cooper is no longer a Cleveland Brown, your leading touchdown guy on this team right now is uh, he plays defense. Rodney McLeod two. <laughs> Uh, you've got uh, Elijah Moore, uh, the receiver in the final year of his contract, uh, Mo Hurst, the defensive tackle, Zadarius Smith, Jed Wills Jr., although I don't think anyone's going to be calling about Jed Wills, uh, James Hudson, again, don't think anyone's going to be calling about James Hudson, uh, DeAnthony Bell, they kind of need him right now, same thing with Rodney McLeod, and then, of course, quarterback Jameis Winston. So the, 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 now they, they've got like, I want to say, 24 guys, Andy, that are in the final year of the contracts and are eligible for free agency in 2025. Those are the biggest names uh, on that list. All right. Um, I, I got a couple questions I want, I want to bring up beyond just like this, this whole trading thing. Cause there was a little bit of news today uh, concerning two different things. And I'm going to, let's take a quick time out. We'll come back. We'll address them. One has to do with the stadium and two has to do with legal matters. So, We'll come back. We'll talk about those when we return. And I want to talk about Nick Chubb coming back. Is it you talked about it a little bit? I think we should talk about that a little bit more. It's always game day in Cleveland. It is always game day in Cleveland. He's Daryl Ryder. I'm Andy Baskin. We get set for the next game where uh, the Browns will finally find themselves playing games in the AFC North with Cincinnati at home after this three game trip. I have a couple questions though, just to kind of clean up some stuff before we start actually talking about um, uh, Browns and Bengals coming up this week because that feels like it's a million miles away. Um, Daryl, there was uh, talk about Deshaun Watson again. Uh, the commissioner said that the investigation is still on over the last uh, lawsuit that was filed but was settled last week. Is there anything more to that, or could Deshaun still find himself uh, being suspended? I'll be honest with you. I'll be surprised if that investigation goes anywhere. Um, I, you know, let's Let's call it – this is my opinion. Let's call it the way it is. That's probably why Deshaun settled the lawsuit was so mm -hmm. that she would not cooperate with the NFL. So I don't anticipate, and I don't, again, this is my opinion. I don't know this to be fact, and I want people to understand this uh, or understand that aspect. But I would be surprised if she ultimately ends up cooperating with the NFL now because, you know, she and Watson settled this uh, civil litigation. And uh, I, I don't know what the NFL could do as far as evidence and whatnot, if you don't have cooperation, remember the last time he was, when he ultimately ended up with the, the $5 million fine, 11 game suspension as part of the disciplinary settlement. Um, there was evidence, right? It was, they, they, there was witness testimony from, you know, accusers. I believe it was four cases. If I remember correctly, that the league really honed in on and used against Watson. Um, and, so if there isn't cooperation from this accuser, 
and and while the allegations are heinous and the most severe levied and let, let's call it what it was. I mean, what was described in the lawsuit, although it was termed a, a, you know, sexual assault and battery. I mean, what was described in that lawsuit was rape. Um, that, I mean, that is what was described uh, in the narrative that was submitted uh, to the, the civil court. So, um, you know, I can understand why the NFL is still pursuing uh, looking into it because of the seriousness of what was alleged in that suit, but sure. the fact that it's been settled, I can't imagine. I, I would I would think that as part of that settlement, which uh, the story Tom itself though tarnishes the shield. Yeah, well, true, the, the, not true yeah, or whatever. Well, but, so he told me it was confidential. The settlement, and so right. if it's a confidential settlement, I don't think that they're going to be talking to the league office. That's my point. And so if if they don't have that testimony, right. And they don't have any evidence that she might uh, submit to them that supports her claim that she made in civil court, right, prior mm -hmm. to the settlement. Well, I, I don't know how the NFL can can punish Deshaun there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I get it. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Because, next, next, let, let me move on to the next, like, off the field thing. Um, and I'm just curious on your thought. That it looks like the land bridge is going in, which was a big part of the stadium issue a long time ago. Um, the city, the story came out this afternoon, the city's getting like 60 million, uh, to build that land bridge. It's interesting that they show the stadium uh, let me still existing. So let me pause you for a second. It's not for the land bridge. Oh, it's, they show the land bridge in the picture. I, I know. Right? I know. Um, it's for state route two. It's okay. federal. It's, it's federal money as part of one of the, inf I, one of the infrastructure things, uh, uh, the, the Senator from the state of Ohio. Uh, the Democratic senator from the state of Ohio, we're in a political season, so I don't want to, you know, you know, make it look like I'm campaigning for anyone or anything like that. But uh, the Democratic senator from Ohio uh, announced that matter. Well, it's, it? yeah, I mean, it, it does matter. Um, but he I'll he, debate you on this one if you want to. But I, I don't want no, I just, I, I don't, just I don't tell me what this is all about. I mean, I don't care if the guy is in the uh, dollars. It's it's like it's fifty nine point seven. That's the exact. OK. Uh, and it's going to do what. You know what they did from the shoreway into Lakewood, going by Edgewater and all that? That used to be freeway, and now it's a boulevard type okay. thing. They're going to do the same thing once you get across the bridge into downtown and come down by the stadium and the lakefront and all that going out to Interstate 90 when it merges in there. That's going to become boulevard. Okay, okay so it's the and so basically Route 2 that goes by the stadium Correct. and goes by Burke Lake for an airport and the, the Rock and Roll Hall. It's Boulevard, so it's no longer going to be a freeway where it's 55, 60 miles an hour going through downtown. Right, it's it goes back 35, 45. It's 35 or a 25 mile an hour zone so that it's safe for pedestrians and stuff like that. But that's what that money's for coming okay. from the federal government. Uh, the land bridge money came from the state. That was about $20 million. Um, and those projects are going to move forward regardless of what the Browns announce when it comes to their stadium plans. And my gut tells me we are going to have an announcement from the Browns soon uh, of what they I mean, Daryl, everybody and their brothers reporting that like, this thing seems like it's a done deal. We've been talking about it for more than a year. It feels that way. I mean, yeah. am I, and I, and I, I posted this on X today. I responded to someone's question and I, I just basically posted that my, um, I said my expectation and opinion is the lakefront will become stadium free for a complete development and the Browns will build the dome in Brook Park. That is what I believe is going to happen. Um, I'm not saying it's hundred percent going to happen. That is my belief based on the information that I have that when it, uh, when the uh, decision is made and revealed and that, because there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes, the Browns are not going to announce this project unless they have the, the, the eyes dotted and the T's crossed as far as the, some of the behind the scenes stuff. That means, Land acquisition is in place. They do have the purchase agreement, or I should say the purchase option agreement in place for that 176 acres. But I'm talking land purchase, who's ultimately going to own that land, who's going to own the dome. Uh, you know, major uh, funding components for the dome are going to be in play. You know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah. They're, yeah they're I, it's funny because, I mean, we're talking about this whole thing, and I was reading the story about, you know, what the $60 million thing is. In the back of my mind, I'm like, there's got to be a way at some point that if they do get rid of Burke Lake for an airport for complete, you know, complete renovation down there, that there's got to be a way to get rid of Dead Man's Curve because of how you right. know how bad it is. And and that and I think that would be the the use for that and not put trying to put a stadium down there for uh, sure. Yeah, 
But uh, yeah, I mean, you're you're going to see now. Um, I think now that this has been announced, I think this opens the door for things to move forward. And and, and just real quick, I did a total. All the construction projects that are proposed for Cuyahoga County right now, including the dome, no, Brook Park Dome, two point four. Uh, I'll just read them off. Brook Park Dome, the uh, Brook Park development next to the dome, uh, the Berea uh, Browns Complex, Hopkins Airport. The downtown riverfront project and the lakefront comes out to over $11 billion in construction projects. Let me throw another one at you, too. The uh, the Metro Parks uh, Stadium for the soccer. Yeah. there's I, I don't know if it's federal money, but there's, there's money involved a, in that, too. A, well, there's a courthouse, too, going in. They're, they're working on, like, a county courthouse and justice center, too. But I didn't have the details on that, so I didn't really want to include that. But, yeah, I mean – yeah, so you could be talking uh, close to twelve billion dollars in construction projects uh, over the next decade or so uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. That's just absolutely fantastic. So send your kids to trade schools. Have them be masons, steel workers, electricians, plumbers, yes. electricians. There is hundreds of thousands of dollars a year you can make it working in one of those trades. And there's no shame working with your hands. I think that's one of the greatest. Well, my dad was an electrician for my entire life. So. It's one of the yeah. greatest crimes in this country is, is, is so many generations were convinced if you don't go to college and get a four year degree and you're going to be a failure in life. And I think that that is so wrong that so many generations, including myself, I, you know, I kept being told, Daryl, if you don't go to college, you're going to be a failure in life. You're going to be a nobody. You're never going to accomplish anything. Don't sell yourself anybody. short, Daryl. You're a complete nobody. You're good with that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I'm dead serious. If, if you, you know, if you're artistic and you like making things and that, get into the trades. There's a ton of construction work, and, and that is one recession-proof industry. People always need stuff built, and they always need stuff fixed. That's my PSA. All righty. Um, Daryl, just quickly, we've got about a minute left here. Just your thoughts on Nick Chubb's return and what that would mean for Sunday's game. Yeah. Beyond uh, the fans. I'm, I'm talking about the football aspect of it. Yeah, I'm more concerned with the football aspect of them playing the Bengals. You know, it, it, look, it's going to be great. You know, uh, um, I kind of don't want the offense introduced on Sunday because I don't want to hear Deshaun Watson get booed real bad. Is that mandatory? Do they always do that? I don't, I don't no, know. They, no, they, rotate, that. they rotate between offense and defense. But I can understand why they want to, if they do introduce the offense, so Nick Chubb can get the roaring ovation that he deserves. But right. uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be great. But uh, Joe Burrow's never won in Cleveland. Uh, we'll see if that streak continues. I'm not confident. Chase Brown, Zach Moss, uh, dynamic duo in the backfield. Uh, Cincinnati's run game is is really really good. Of course, they got Jamar Chase and T. Higgins. Those are always problem children uh, to deal with. Their defense is, um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, the Trey Henderson had a couple of sacks last week. Uh, Sam Hubbard, uh, you know, is getting his paws on footballs and things like that. So this is going to be a tough football game for the Browns. And um, it would be nice if they could win it just so people can decompress a little bit. You know what I mean? But um, I, I do feel like uh, the Bengals are closer to being a playoff contender than the Cleveland Browns are. And my fear is we're going to find that out on Sunday. All right, that's the next time we're going to talk to you is after the game on Sunday. Of course, we love when you watch the post-game uh, edition of It's Always Game Day in Cleveland. Uh, for Evan O'Brien, our great producer, he's Daryl Ryder. I'm Andy Baskin. We'll see you again on Sunday immediately following the game, and we'll pick up all the pieces after the clock hits zero. It's always game day in Cleveland.